what we have now in 2024 is not going to look like this uh, two to two to four years down the road. I think I don't think a lot's going to change short term, but I think college football is going to go through a, another explosion here in a couple of years. Hello and welcome in to Always College Football. We took a week off. It was our, I guess you could call it our spring break. It was really early to be on spring break, so that's not exactly what we did. I was still working. I was still around here, but we decided to take a couple days off just to kind of refresh, regather. We're hitting the ground running yet again today. Spring football is upon us, but there are some big picture topics that are going on in the sport. We're going to have Paul Feinbaum join us today to help us break down Tennessee and Virginia. We're going to help us break down the 5 plus 7 model for the college football playoff, talk about the future of conference championship games, talk about the calendar and how that might ultimately drive more and more coaches away. A lot of big picture discussions that we want to get to with Paul Feinbaum, so we'll have him on in just a minute. As always, we've got Mark Kubiak, Jake Garcia, Jack Foster, and I'm Greg McElroy. We have a terrific show in store for you today. We have some big news and notes that we need to get to as well. Eric Bieniemy's back in the college world. Georgia State has landed, I think, a huge fish, a huge fish from the University of Georgia and Steve Sarkeesian, He's got enough money to buy a few ranches in the state of Texas now. So without much further ado, let's dive in. It's Paul Feinbaum of the SEC Network. We welcome him in from ESPN, ABC, SEC Network. He's Paul Feinbaum of the Paul Feinbaum Show. What's going on today, Paul? How are you, my friend? Greg, I'm doing great. Seems like uh, forever since I've seen you. Well, it's amazing with all the things that have gone on in college football, we haven't had a chance to really visit about where we're at in the world. So when you assess, I guess, the last two or three months, whether it's Nick Saban retiring, Ohio State's hot run in the portal and other places, Jim Harbaugh leaving for the NFL, Michigan winning their first undisputed national championship since 1948, what do you think in the last couple months has been the biggest story in the college football world? Well, I think specifically it's the end of Saban because – we have so rarely ever, if ever, maybe once uh, in modern time, had a moment like this. Uh, and it had so many reverberations uh, with with the players leaving and then the players leaving Washington and then all the other uh, domino effects. So, I mean, that, that was a, a jolt. Uh, I think long term, uh, the court case is maybe uh, more important, uh, the one in Tennessee recently, uh, that may have, that may have essentially killed off the the, uh, the NCAA, but but I think when you when you look at it, uh, there you know, it's just it was jaw dropping in a, in a 24 hour period. Uh, Harbaugh was on the verge of leaving. Saban did. Uh, then from the, the the professional world, Belichick. Uh, I mean, it, w- it was highly unusual at, at that time of the year to get that much uh, not only breaking news but uh, but just earth shattering news. Now, I want to get to some of the things that have gone on as far as the college football playoff uh, and a few other topics for sure. But before we do, uh, you are amazingly studious when it comes to the NCAA, its history, uh, what battles it's chosen to fight, uh, how victorious they've been in the past. Um, the Tennessee, Virginia aspect of it. It, it. I know that the NCAA is a dying breed as it relates to college football, but how much has this fight that Tennessee and Virginia now are taking to the NCAA, how much has this accelerated their inevitable demise uh, as kind of the overarc of everything that we know in the sport we love? Yeah, Greg, the easiest thing to do on a talk show or on anything is to say the NCAA is dead. It's not really dead because we're a couple weeks away from the biggest show uh, really in sports in many respects, and that's the NCAA basketball tournament. But what is dead is the NCAA's ability to enforce its own rules. Uh, Friday afternoon, that was the final blow because uh, the the NCAA has nowhere to go. Uh, they're not going to fight this in court because they, they don't have a path. They essentially waved the the white flag with with a typical, typically stupid NCAA statement, which is was as disingenuous as anything I've, I've seen from them. You know, basically saying we need we need Congress's help, uh, but. In, in terms of what it really means, it's already been said, but if you want to cheat, go ahead and cheat. You're not going to be caught. Uh, until now, uh, it, we've called it the wild, wild west. Now, essentially, because of this judge in East Tennessee, 
no matter you can do whatever you want and nobody has it can do anything about it uh, and, and that's really the first time that, that the NCAA has been brought to its knees. They deserve it, all this because uh, they are an arrogant, uh, out of control group of people who have lost con- who, who have lost uh, its grip on the on, on the on the world of college athletics for a long time. Uh, and and now the only difference is uh, Mark Emmert, the the president until recently, was somebody that was easy to hate. Charlie Baker is a likable guy, uh, but he basically is a politician in a in a three thousand dollar suit who uh, sounds good and looks good, but is not changing or moving the needle one iota. Yeah, it certainly seems that way. And I like Charlie Baker. Like you said, I, I don't know anyone that has uh, as a negative view of, of who he is, what he stands for, the change he's trying to implement. Like, I think he just is sitting there with his hands tied and there isn't a whole lot that can be done to to save where we're going as a sport. Let's get into the college football playoff because that's really where we're wanting to go with, with this discussion. Um, the five plus seven model was unanimous, unanimously accepted. Uh, it's understandable. Um, no, the PAC 12 is no more. However, I, I still am not 100% on board with where we're at with automatic qualifiers. Um, and I've just, before I give my opinion on it, Paul, I'd, I'd like to get your take on, on how you feel about the new model that, that was, that is going to be used for the next two post seasons. Well, Greg, it's so convoluted because anytime we don't have the best teams uh, being seated like the best teams, uh, it's an imperfect model. But you and I know that to get to get sign off in these rooms with people from all walks of life uh, and all geographies, this is how they had to do it. Um, but it, it is patently absurd that the number one team and the best team in the country could get rated uh, fifth in, in the seedings. It doesn't make much sense, but. Uh, I, I think it's just a it, it's it's something that will take time uh, to get to uh, where it's done correctly and, and like it should be. But it's still better. And I know this is not the answer that people want. It's so much better than where we were, uh, because, uh, you know, we, we have both had millions, uh, millions of conversations about uh, the four team playoff. It's, it's it's hardly ever been the four best teams. It's a it's an amalgamation of. Of special interest, and that's how we end up getting where, we, where we've been. This is better than that. No, no denying that. I think it's progress. Um, and I, I'm at the point, Paul, I, I was totally in favor of the four. I felt like four was fine. The goal is to crown a worthy champion. We've never not done that. So I don't have like a huge issue with where the, where the world was. I, I understand where we need to go and that growth was inevitable. Um, 12, we'll start there. Is 12 the right number? Is it too many? Is it too few? Is 12 where we need to be starting this upcoming season? I think in, in, a, in a perfect world, it is too many, uh, because I don't think, uh, you get down to 10 and 11 and 12 and they're probably really, uh, in a, in a good spot to even compete. But I've heard some say eight is the best number, but I mean, we're at 12. So let's look at it that way. I, I think it's, it's it's going to be fun and entertaining and, and yeah, it's going to look a little bit like the NFL, but what doesn't look like the NFL and, and when you have the success record that they have had. So I, I like the inclusion. I, I like the fact that uh, there are more parts of college football that, that will matter. Um, some will say maybe maybe that really won't be the case. It's going to be an SEC Big Ten party. Well, I'm not I'm not opposed to that either. Uh, I, I just want I, I just want the college football season to reflect uh, a little more uh, population and, and and gain more interest as opposed to having two games uh, on January first that matter, one more after that, and the rest of them just being exhibitions. Yeah, I'm good with that. I think the bowl season will certainly kind of fall by the wayside, but at the, at the same time, hasn't it been falling by the wayside for the better part of a decade? I, I still watch it. Uh, I know you do too, but I'm not sitting there freaking out about whether or not the Big Ten has a better bowl record than the ACC. It doesn't right. matter, uh, especially knowing that a lot of those guys that are participating in the game didn't participate in the regular season, which ultimately led to them being invited to that game. When you look at the five plus seven model, uh, I have kind of gotten to the point now, Paul, where I just acknowledge I just acknowledge that the G5 and the Power 5 are very different. Uh, with the advent of the portal, with the advent of NIL, uh, you're seeing great group of five players kind of get picked every year 
to go join Power 5 leagues. It's reflected in the NFL draft. Uh, it's been reflected with the, I guess you could say, complete beatdowns the last few years of the G5 program. Uh, last year, Liberty, I know Tulane beat SC the year before, but prior to that, the G5 had traditionally been remarkably competitive against the Power 5, but it's kind of become less and less over the last couple of years. I feel like that gap is widening significantly, especially now that some of the best G5 programs are now in the Power 5 and the Big 12, like Cincy, UCF, BYU, Houston, you name it. So um, why is there at this point a need to satisfy the G5 when it comes to the 12-team format? There is none. Uh, and and I, 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 again, though, knowing these commissioners, and we do know them, and they're very uh, top, top-rate top people, uh, they try to be collegial. <laughs> and I, I, I wouldn't be. You wouldn't be. Um, but that's why we're uh, in the fields we're in, and, and they are able to, to get people to coalesce around them in a room like that. But, no, I, I don't want to see. Uh, I mean, I, I felt badly for Liberty this year. They had a great season, and it just seemed like it got torched on that final game, um, it, they, there's no way they can compete. Uh, and they are simply going to be sacrificial lambs. So at what point do you think in 26, the Big Ten and the SEC have already said, hey, we're starting to kind of work together. And I, I know that while Greg Sankey and Tony Petiti have said, yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're going to make sure that we, we satisfy everybody. We're, we're not, this is not an indicator of us pulling away but we're going to still try to do things the way they've always been done because it's always worked. Um, but even though they say a certain thing, do you believe them, Paul, that even though they're now operating together and they're bouncing ideas off of each other, do you believe that they won't pull away here at some point in the near future? I don't think they'll pull away yet, Greg, but, but I, I, th I think there are a lot of reasons for that, uh, that relationship. And I, I think some of it is kind of the, the same thing we're talking about here, the frustration of those two leagues to have to sit there and listen to all these other people uh, have an equal voice. And I mean, I'm all for democracy and I'm all for everybody being heard, but at some point uh, it, it does ruin the final product when, when we, we get, when we're talking about what we're just got through talking about. I, I think they're also there for, uh, to try to have each other's back because I think we're heading for a, a very uh, turbulent period in uh, a, a continuation of a turbulent period that we, we've been going through with, with conference expansion and, and schools are simply looking for, for a better way. I mean, just, just this, this Florida State story, which is a little complex, is fascinating to watch. And I'm, I'm guessing that it is going to have disruptive results, whether it's in that court case or just overall within the framework of, of what they're trying to do. And I think Petiti and Sankey know that everyone wants in those two uh, respective leagues. And why not you know, have a coalition where at least they can talk to each other uh, and maybe protect each other as opposed to get, getting ransomed by some of these other schools who are playing one versus the other. Well, let's look at the Florida State, for example. I mean, if Florida State does win this court case uh, and challenging the grant of rights in the ACC, uh, what does that mean for the ACC? And ultimately, what does that mean for all the leagues not named SEC and Big Ten? Well, I think it means it means serious trouble, and I mean there are so many uh, nuances in this case. Uh, it's hard for me to believe it's going to go the distance. Uh, I think the ACC has way too much to lose, uh, and I mean there's a lot of factors there, and you know the ACC, you know probably wisely, even though it was easy to make fun of, went out, went out and got a few more schools. Uh, they didn't do that because they thought uh, those three, uh, SMU, Stanford, and Cal, were adding that, you know, brand value. They did it for, for, from a protection standpoint, I think, because of their television agreement. They, they, need, they need more schools. They couldn't get uh, you know, stuck there uh, you know, getting wiped out in case something happened. So, uh, I mean, that was, a, that was a preemptive move, but it, it's hard to believe long term that the ACC can remain intact. It certainly doesn't feel like they're going to be there for the long term. Uh, in the event in which Florida State does win uh, in that challenge of the grant of rights. As we move uh, into a team that, that does not currently uh, play under a conference banner, Notre Dame, uh, they're still the bell of the ball. They still are, I think, highly, highly important to the ecosystem that is college football, but they could get wedged out 
if they don't ultimately decide, hey, we need to join the SEC, we need to join the Big Ten. I think most people assume the Big Ten would be their destination. But, Paul, what if the SEC and the Big Ten do decide to leave? Then what does that mean for Notre Dame? Well, I think at that point, Notre Dame has to has to make a move. And uh, Notre Dame has probably been wise. It's been easy to criticize them. Well, why, did, why didn't you get in the ACC uh, during COVID when the ACC had their back? Well, I, I don't know if they saw what was happening. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But, but, but by sticking uh, to their guns, they, they, they may be benefiting because while the Big Ten certainly is their geographical move, I, I mean, I, I could see them doing either one. Um, but but I think ultimately uh, the Big Ten will, uh, the Big Ten will get Notre Dame. It makes it, way, it makes way too much sense. And I don't really care about you know fifty or hundred year old feuds. Uh, that doesn't matter anymore. That's always been the excuse given. But but I think it's time for Notre Dame. Uh, I, I was on a program the other day where one of my co-hosts said that they're simply not relevant. That's not true. Uh, they are relevant. They're not as relevant as they think they are. Uh, but they're still pretty important uh, in 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 the in, in the world that we we live in every day. Yeah, I, I mean, I I think they're as relevant as anybody. Uh, I also think they could, in the event in which things don't move forward. I mean, they could start attracting more and more schools to the independent ranks uh, when grant of rights run out elsewhere, and they could start their own movement. So I think Notre Dame is highly important. Uh, and will be a fascinating part of the conversation moving forward. But as it relates to them in the college football playoff, they're never going to have a conference championship, so therefore they're never going to have a first-round bye, at least the way that things are structured right now. Uh, is that going to be okay with Notre Dame? Or, or are they totally fine coming from the at-large pool and potentially chasing a championship? I think they're okay with it. And, and as you know, Jack Swarbrick was on the original committee that put this thing together. So they saw it coming. And, 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 and I think they'll benefit long term because it, it, if, if we go to uh, 14 or 16, the first round buys may, may be extinct anyway. So uh, they'll be protected from that standpoint. So, but, but I think ultimately the, what, we, what we have now in 2024 is not going to look like this. Uh, two to two to four years down the road, I think I don't think a lot's going to change short term, but I think college football is going to go through a, another explosion here in a couple of years. It certainly feels that way. And if I were in charge of the Big Ten and you were in charge of the SEC, if I'm Tony Petiti, I would say we're done with automatic qualifiers. We'll go to fourteen. We'll go to sixteen. That's fine. But I want five to be from my league, Mister Sankey. I want five to be from your league, and then. All the rest of the schools in the country, you guys are fighting for those last four or six spots. And what's to stop them from doing that? I don't think there's anything to stop them. And, you know, I don't know Petiti, but I, obviously we both know Greg Sankey pretty well. And, and I, I think this, this, this coalition is one of the smartest things that they've done because uh, it's, like, it's like any other business. Yeah, they're, they're fierce competitors. Uh, but you, if, you, if you follow the stock market, Greg, when, uh, when Coke has a, a big day, usually Pepsi does too. Uh, they, they move in, they, they, you know, m mutual fund buyers buy, uh, managers, they, they buy groups. And, they, and right now the SEC and the Big Ten are, are, are a coalition. Uh, so you can fight it out on the field, but, but they need protection in the boardrooms. And I think that's why this was a, I know we all made a lot out of it. And then the, the two commissioners tried to downplay it. But it, it, is, it is one of the more significant moments in, in college athletics history, the fact that these two uh, are joining forces, because it really it, it, doesn't leave, it, it doesn't leave the ACC or the Big 12 anywhere to go. Uh, it, we're, we're, not to use a NASCAR phrase, but who are their drafting partners? They can get everybody else, and they're still not going to matter. But if you look at a potential move to a 14-team or a 16-team, which I think is totally likely— because I think we're going to find, Paul, and, and we'll have this conversation on this program. We've had this conversation on other pro programs as well. Winning a conference championship doesn't do that much for you. Because, frankly, right. if you really look at the calendar, you play a conference championship game on, say, December 3rd. Great, you win it. That's awesome. You get the first round by. That's great. But now you have to wait four weeks between games, whereas the team that you're going to be playing against in the second round, if you will, will have just knocked off the rust against a lower-level team. In some cases, a team from the G5. So, so yeah, great. You get the first round by. That's awesome. But you're playing against a team that's a lot, I, I think, more well-equipped 
to play in a championship setting than you are having sat there for four weeks. So I think what we could get to, Paul, and this is a scary thing, and I think this would force the hand of both Greg Sankey, Tony Petiti, and the other commissioners of the sport to take a good long look at conference championship games because I could see teams running their backups out there, losing the game, not intentionally, but not putting a lot of stock into it because they're better off knowing that they're already in the field of playing in that first round as opposed to playing in a conference championship. No, I think you're right. Uh, and we're a couple weeks away from the conference tournaments, and they're fun because they get people, their mindset on Thursday and Friday into basketball. But, I mean, how many times have you watched a Sunday matchup uh, between Kentucky and Auburn or uh, Duke and North Carolina? It just doesn't matter. Uh, by the way, the folks up in Indianapolis have already put the seeds on the board. I mean, I mean if, it's a, if it's an upstart, then it matters. And, and this is the same way. I, I hate to see it uh, being a traditionalist, but uh, they'll figure something out. And the, and the amount of money that is going to be uh, uh, accelerated with those, two, with those extra games will somehow make up for the SEC championship game or the Big Ten championship game. In, in say, five years, Paul, do you think we still have conference championship games? No. Uh, I, I think it, as it goes to uh, – if it, if it expands beyond 12, I think that almost eliminates it. I can't envision a scenario uh, similar to to you. I, I just don't know what benefit they serve, which is disappointing because they've meant a lot for a long yeah. time. But now when you're already going to have rematches, and in some cases you might have teams play each other three times throughout the course of the season, it just feels redundant and, and somewhat unnecessary. Paul, we'll get you out of here on this. Uh, we've seen a lot of people, a lot of people leaving college football to take on NFL jobs, whether it's Jeff Halfley, a ton of position coaches have done that. We've seen guys at the Power 5 level uh, take coordinator jobs, like leaving head coaching jobs at the G5 level. How much do you think this has to do with the calendar? How much do you think this has to do with the quality of life? Uh, what do you think is prompting this move? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a combination of, of, of all those. I, I don't think this is something that we're at an epidemic stage right now. Uh, if you're a columnist for one of, one of these publications, it's easy to say that. But, I mean, this has been building for some time. And if, especially if you're an older coach, uh, you do need a break, and there, there simply is no break. Um, so I also don't necessarily feel sorry for some of these guys. I mean, we're, we're talking about coaches. I mean, the worst coach in, in the two biggest conferences are still making – six to eight million dollars uh and and with that comes the, the calendar uh but I, I just think we're at a at a at an inflection point in college athletics where it, it is an ad, it, it's an adjustment uh it, it is chaotic uh but it's also uh as a fan which is what i am i'm not a coach it's pretty exciting i mean you never know what's going to happen uh we have it's always somewhat uh, disappointing when the season ends uh, the season ended on a Tuesday, and for the next two weeks, I mean, it, it was literally it was like free agency in the <laughs> NBA, or Major League Baseball. Uh, it was chaos, and and I think that's always one of the problems with college football. It, it it's such a finite period of time; it's shorter than the other schedules. Uh, it goes off the radar, and 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 I, I think that's that's if, if college football really is the number two sport, which we're all told it is, and you can read by the numbers. It needs to have a, a, a it needs to have more more moments in time uh, like the other le like like professional sports where people are paying attention as opposed to just go dark and, uh, and and nobody talks about it for three months. Yeah, I think a year round staying in the spotlight year round is certainly good for business. That's for sure. The NFL has mastered it, um, and while the NBA regular season isn't as watchable. The NBA offseason is really entertaining. Uh, so I can, I can totally see what you're saying. Paul, terrific stuff as always, my friend. We look forward to having you back on again soon. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Greg. Terrific conversation with Paul Feinbaum there, but it's time to move into some news and notes going on right now in college football. Steve Sarkeesian becomes the latest head coach to clips the $10 million a year mark. My question is, what took so long? Uh, if you look at what he's done in the short time that he's been the head coach of the Texas Longhorns, they have, even this first year, now people will look back and they'll look back at the record and they will reflect on the missed opportunities in the second half and the leads that went by the wayside and all these other things. And while that is totally true, 
If you look at the steady ascent and the steady growth, look, I know they went five and seven, but if you look at how many games they were in control of at one point or another and how they let them slip away, they improved that drastically heading into year number two, and they improved that drastically heading into year number three, even though there were moments this year where they did have a big lead at halftime, only to make the game much more interesting in the second half, more interesting than it needed to be, but it's no denying right now the progress that's been made under Steve Sarkeesian. Ask anybody, whether you love the Longhorns, hate the Longhorns, how many people right now want to play the Longhorns? There's not a lot. And that's a testament to the staff. It's a testament to Steve Sarkeesian and the players for buying in and really changing the narrative for the Longhorns the last couple years. Del McGee is officially leaving the Georgia Bulldogs. He's going to become the head coach of Georgia State. Now, he's been in the running for a while. I mean, it's I feel like it's been five, maybe six, maybe seven, maybe ten openings where his name has been floated out there, not just as a head coach, uh, as a coordinator, in large part due to just what a recruiter he is. I mean, he is universally respected. It's a tough spot. Right now, it's a really tough spot if you're the G5. I think it's almost impossible to keep and and retain and attract coaches. Because the second you have a guy start to do well, Sean Elliott, for example, at Georgia State, start to do pretty well. He's getting paid decent. I think he was there in the lower, maybe mid-800s or so. Well, you can go now and become a position coach in the Power Five. A lot less of the administrative stuff. A lot less of the of the fundraising stuff. More just X's, O's, strictly ball. Quality of life gets better. You're worried about less guys on the team because the head coach, you got 120 guys. Well, if you're the tight ends coach, you have seven. To me, it's going to be harder and harder and harder for G5 programs to retain coaches. That's why you see a guy like Mo Linguist at Buffalo take a co-DC job at Alabama. You see Kane Womack, head coach at South Alabama, won 10 games a couple years ago. He's now the DC at Alabama. We've seen a handful of those all over the place, by the way. So I think it's going to be more and more difficult. But the fact that Georgia State was able to go and get a guy in state that is known for his recruiting prowess and is universally respected in that part of the world, Del McGee is a terrific hire. Terrific hire. I can't wait to see what he's done because he's been on everyone's radar for a while now. Now he gets the keys to a car that's actually pretty good. Georgia State has had a lot of moments the last few years. Now, have they had the consistent, steady success? No, we haven't seen that from Georgia State. But we know Del McGee, especially in the portal. You look at what Fran Brown did at Syracuse, how much his, I guess, taking over that job, how many different guys started to flock to Syracuse, including Kyle McCord, including a couple of other guys with four stars, five stars in some cases. They started to consider Syracuse because of how good Fran Brown is on the trail. Maybe Georgia State will be able to do the same with Del McGee. So that is very exciting. And then Eric Bieniemy, former offensive coordinator of the Washington Commanders, former offensive coordinator of the Kansas City Chiefs, by all accounts has had several opportunities in the past to potentially become a head coach, has interviewed multiple times in the NFL. Well, he is now going to be going to UCLA to become the offensive coordinator. So Now, here's the one thing. He's been in college before. He spent some time at Colorado. He spent some time at UCLA, so he's familiar with the landscape. But you got to wonder for Eric Bieniemy, a guy that has been very successful, very well respected, has been on everyone's short list as far as head coaching jobs in the NFL. You got to wonder how long is he going to be at UCLA? And it's going to be great. He signed a two-year contract, by the way. That, to me, kind of bells and whistles went off there. Usually, you'd like to see three, in some cases, four. But a two-year contract, that raised my antenna. But the fact that he now is going to be calling plays for UCLA is terrific. I think that's a really, really, really big coup, for the most part, for UCLA. But at the same time, there is part of me that is a little curious. Now that he's back in college, it's a lot different than the college that he coached a few years ago. How is he going to like it? We've talked so long about guys flocking from college to the NFL because the quality of life is better. Well, will Eric Bieniemy feel the same way 
Now he's back in the deep end of the pool there in Southern California as the OC for UCLA. But I'm fired up about UCLA being able to bring him back. But it is a little bit surprising to see a guy go in the other direction. And credit to Deshaun Foster. His first year head coach, bringing some NFL ties, bringing some guys with roots there in Southern California. Makes a ton of sense. But hopefully you can keep him because Eric Bieniemy is going to be on the short list of a lot of head coaching coordinator openings, not just in college, but in the NFL sooner than later. Before we close, just want to talk quickly about field storming, court storming. It's a bit of a hot topic of debate right now. Duke lost to Wake Forest this past weekend. Kyle Filipowski, one of their best players, was injured there in the court storming. We also saw something similar with Caitlin Clark, of Iowa a few weeks ago, a month ago or so, she ran into someone that was storming the court. We have seen this for a while now. And I'll be the first one to admit, I might feel like an old man that's yelling at the clouds, all right? But I feel like we storm the court or we storm the field more now than ever before. Wake Forest was favored against Duke. Favored and storm the court. I know Duke was top 10 in the country and all these other things. I know it's a big rivalry. I know Wake Forest is having a resurgent basketball season. But y'all, we stormed the court. We stormed the field for everything. Look, everybody wants to have their viral min- moment. Everybody wants to have the, the video on, on social media of you on the field doing crazy things, maybe antagonizing a player. I'm all for everybody having fun. Have no problem with it whatsoever. But fines aren't going to stop kids from running on the court. It's not going to happen. LSU got fined $100,000. Sounds good. You think those kids are concerned about LSU having to write a six-figure check? Probably not. We've seen $250,000 fines levied. We've seen ample fines levied all over the place. Course storming is banned. As a result, the school gets fined. But no one's going to stop these kids from going on. What I would say, though, if there's something that... If there is a takeaway... You go on the field, fine. Do what you got to do. But when you start being destructive of other teams' property, and I've talked to multiple schools about this, multiple schools that have experienced a court storming or field storming that lose thirty, thirty-five thousand, forty thousand dollars worth of equipment because it's damaged in the process of people rushing the field. I get it. It happens. Might not seem like a lot of money to programs that have a lot, but that's where I start to get concerned. And then the possibility of the player who is antagonized, them potentially reacting negatively in the spur of the moment, in an emotional moment, that concerns me as well. So if you're going to storm the court, just stay away from the players. And if you're a player and you acknowledge that People are storming the court or storming the field. Put your helmet on and avoid everybody en route to the locker room where you can collect your emotions and collect your thoughts. But it's not going to go away. It's not going to stop. So I don't know why we keep continuing to pretend like we can ban court storming or field storming. It's not going to happen. If you're going to stop 40,000 people from running on the field, good luck. With 250 security guards, that ain't going to happen. So... If you're going to do it, just do so peacefully. (laughs) Do so where you're not trying to draw attention to yourself. You're not trying to draw attention to a player because a player just had their heart ripped out, perhaps, uh, in a heartbreaking game and a heartbreaking effort. It's not the time to go and get into those players' faces and to kind of antagonize them with your cell phones or whatever it may be. So if you're going to storm the court, I know we can't stop you, but just do so responsibly. Simple as that. For all of us here at Always College Football, continue to ask everyone to like, rate, subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your show. Doesn't matter where you get it. Just like, rate, subscribe. That'd be awesome. If you're on the ESPN YouTube channel, go ahead and subscribe to the ESPN YouTube channel for college football. That'd be terrific as well. And for all of us here at Always College Football, after a nice long week-long break, we're back, we're refreshed. And we got spring football that is starting up here very, very soon. We'll dive into some of that a little bit later this week. So for all of us, for Mark, Jake, Jack, I'm Greg. We hope you have a wonderful day. And remember, it's always college football. Hey, guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.